Good morning. Yay. <laughs> That's better. All right, first of all, um, a heads up, there is a lot of code in my slides, so if you'd like to grab a copy, there's a link up there. I also tweeted it out earlier this morning, if that's a convenient way to grab it. So a lot of us switch over to JavaScript from other languages and might not have a chance to learn some of the fundamentals. And even when we do have a chance for training, oftentimes it's in a framework and not vanilla JavaScript. JavaScript does some unusual things, some unexpected things with variables. And when we misuse these, not understanding what's happening behind the scenes, we can often end up with bugs that are difficult to track down. And so the variable crimes we commit against JavaScript. My name is Yolka. I'm a software engineer at FrameBridge. FrameBridge is a Washington DC startup working on disrupting the custom art framing space. We do both e-commerce and manufacturing. I'm on the e-commerce side of the house, selling people custom art frames. And with that, I write a lot of JavaScript. All right, I'm going to talk to you about a couple things today. I'm going to talk about scopes in JavaScript, types of functions, hoisting, arrays and objects, and how they are treated specially in JavaScript, and ES6. Most of my code examples are going to use var. Um, the concepts I illustrate with var for scope will apply themselves very well later on when I talk about let and const and how those function differently from var. All right, so let's jump into some code. Some silly little code. I'm gonna set up a variable pink with the value one, and then I'll take a look at the value if in pink. So I can console log it out, and I'll get a one. At this point, I can also ask for window.pink, and I'll also get one. I'm working in my global scope or my window scope at this point, so when I set up variables, I'll also set up, show up as properties in my window object. Now, here's the same code with a small change. I've got a var here, so var fuchsia equals two. I'll take a look at fuchsia, and I'll see the value two. And window.fuchsia, again, I'll get that value two. So none of the behavior has changed yet. And that is in part because I'm only dealing with one scope. In order to make some short code examples that have multiple scopes, I'm going to use a lot of immediately invoked anonymous functions. And those look like this. They start off by setting up an anonymous function, so a function without a name, and then I'll have um, open and close parens with no parameters. Then we've got our curly brackets and code that we want to execute. So this gives us a function, an anonymous function, and we want to execute it right away. So we'll put another pair of parentheses at the end, and that'll execute our code in the function. And then to make our browser happy, we'll put a set of parens around the entire thing. All right, so this pattern is going to be in a lot of my slides. And here's the first one. So I've got a function, an anonymous function here, that gets invoked immediately. Inside that function, I'm going to set magenta to 3, and then I'll take a look at magenta, and I'll see the value 3. I can take a look at window.magenta here, and I'll see 3. When I come outside of this function, I can take a look at magenta again, I'll still have 3, and window.magenta is still 3. Now, we're still not seeing a change in behavior, but here's where we start to see it. Same code as before, but now we have var rouge equals four. So uh, when I come in here and I set up my var rouge equals four, I can then come down and try and use rouge and see that it has the value of four. Now when I ask for window.rouge, I'm going to get undefined. I can come outside of this function, and again, window.rouge is still undefined. And if I try and use rouge directly, I'll get a JavaScript error and my code will stop executing. So what's happening here is with this var on the second line, we're specifying that rouge should only be available in its parent function. So it's only going to be available uh, inside these three lines inside this function. When we come out of that function down here, it's no longer available to us. It's scoped inside this, this anonymous function. And that is also why it's not available on that window object, because it's not available in our global scope, which is the area outside of that function in this example. All right, here's a more complicated example of the same thing going on. I've got two immediately invoked functions that are nested, so one inside another. Uh, in the first one, I go and set up blush, var blush equals five. Then I go into the second function, and I console log out blush and I'll get the value five. I can go ahead and change the value of blush to six, and when I take a look at six after that, I'll have the, val the value, when I take a look at blush after that, I'll have the value six. 
Then I'm going to go on and set up var rows equals 7. And when I try and use rows inside this inner function, I'll get that value 7. Now I'm going to come out of that most uh, inner function down here. Down here, I can take a look at blush, and I still have that new value of 6. But when I try and use rows, I'll get a JavaScript error. I'm going to continue on as if my code didn't stop with that JavaScript error. When we come out of both of those functions, if I try and use blush, I'll get a JavaScript error. And when I try and use rows, I'll get a JavaScript error again. So what's happening here with rows is we're setting rows up with a var. So we are specifying that rows will only be available in that function, in this innermost function. So those five lines of code. Those are the only places where we can use rows. And so when we come out of this innermost function and try and use rows down here, it's no longer available to us. Same with blush. So blush is set up here in the um, outer function, var blush equals 5. And we can continue using it throughout this function, including the, the child function or the child scope. But when we get into the parent scope out here, we'll get that JavaScript error. Here's a silly if statement. Uh, just if true, so we're always going to go in this if statement. I'm going to set up a var maroon equals 29. And if I take a look at maroon, I'll see 29. And when I come out of that if statement, I'll also see 29. That's because var is scoping to the nearest parent function, and if is not a function. And so we still have it available to us outside of that if. This becomes important when dealing with modern JavaScript frameworks because we're often dealing with function inside a function inside a function inside a function, turtles all the way down. And we don't necessarily know where inside of the framework we're working and how all that comes together. This illustrates it as a waterfall. It's actually more complicated as a tree. So I have one function inside of one function inside of one function inside of one function. But in reality, every function can have an arbitrary number of other functions inside of it, creating yet more scopes to manage. All right, pop quiz. Let's apply some of these concepts. So I have some code here where I'm going to set up a var amber equals 11, and then go in an, into an immediately invoked anonymous function and set up var amber equals 12. What value do you think we'll get here? 12? I'm hearing lots of 12s. And that's right, we're going to get a 12. How about out here? 11. You guys know your stuff. Yes, there's that 11. Uh, here's another example. So we have a var pumpkin set up with a value of 13, a function orange, a function tangerine, and then we're going to call orange, which means we'll go into function orange and set pumpkin equal to 14. Then we'll call tangerine and come in here and console log out pumpkin. What value do you expect we'll get here? 14. 14, that's right. We will get a 14 here. And that is because up here we are setting up a var pumpkin equals 13. Um, when we go into orange, we're using the variable pumpkin, but we're not setting up our own pumpkin. We don't have a var pumpkin in here to say we have our own variable called pumpkin in the scope. And so we bubble up to our parent scope to see if that one has its own pumpkin variable. And in this example, it does. So we end up using that variable and changing the value to 14. And then when we go into tangerine and we console log out pumpkin, we're, we have the same thing going on. We're look, checking to see if we have our own pumpkin in the tangerine function. We don't. So we bubble up to our parent scope, um, find that we have this variable, which got changed to 14 and we console log out that value 14. All right, how about this one? I'm going to set up a function ginger and paprika. Then I will call ginger, come in here, set window.peach to 15, and then call paprika, which brings us out here. What do you expect we'll console log out here? I'm hearing 15s. I'm hearing an undefined. So I bring this up because you are very likely to deal with some code that looks like this, but this is an anti-pattern. Please don't do this. <laughs> All right, so what we get here is a 15, and here's why. Uh, when we go into ginger, we're setting window.peach to equal to 15. That means we are going up to our global scope, 
And if it's not already available, if it's not already there, we're setting up a peach variable in that global scope. And then we set the value 15 into that peach variable. When we go into Paprika, um, we're going to try and use the variable peach. We're going to first check whether or not we have a peach specific to our scope. We don't. We haven't set anything up with var peach inside of Paprika. And so we bubble up. We go to our parent scope and we see if we have a peach there. Our parent scope in this example is going to be our global scope, where we just created a peach variable through the window um, object. So you are likely to see code that does this, but please don't do this, because it gets very difficult to track down um, where things are getting set and what affects what. All right, how about this one? I'm going to set up a var terracotta equal 19, and then I have a function blaze. Then I'll go into blaze and um, come to this console log. What do you expect we'll get out here? I'm hearing 19s, I'm hearing 20s, I even heard an undefined out there. So this is a trick question, and that is to segue into talking about variable hoisting. I'll tell you the answer in a moment. All right, so variable hoisting. Our browsers, when they load JavaScript, will go through that JavaScript three times. There'll be three passes. The third pass is when we actually execute the JavaScript. On that first pass, we are going to be looking for places where we set up variables with var or let or const. When we find pieces of code like this on that first pass, what our browser is going to do is break it out. So when we have a var terracotta equals, so we're setting up a variable and putting a value into it, it's going to split it out into two lines. We have a var terracotta, and then we have another line that sets terracotta to 20. Then it's going to take all those var, ter var terracottas and move them up to the top of their scope. So in here, it's going to be scoped to that function. And so we'll end up with a var terracotta at the very beginning of that function. So when we go into Blaze, what, the first thing that happens is we set up our own terracotta variable. And we no longer have access to our parent's terracotta variable because we have our own. So when we come down to that console log for terracotta, we'll get an undefined. Because we do have a variable set up for us in this scope for terracotta, but we haven't put anything into it. This code will continue on and set the value of 20 into terracotta. And if we had any more code executing um, inside this function after here, we could get that value 20 out of terracotta. We had another example happening already with some variable hasting that moved things out of order. And that was this one. We had a var rows on the fourth line of um, this most innermost function. And what our browser was doing with this was pulling it apart and moving var rows up to the top. So we set up our var rows variable all the way up here, but we don't use it until down here. Now, we didn't have any unexpected behavior here because we didn't try and use rows at all in between those two spots. All right, how about this one? I'm going to call a function called chocolate, uh, but I don't define chocolate until later. So what do you think we'll get here when we try and call chocolate? Yes, please. Yes. And that is because of function hoisting. Uh, and with function hoisting, it becomes important to differentiate between named and anonymous functions, because our named functions will be hoisted in JavaScript. So named functions look like this first one. We'll have function, and then a name for that function, and then our parentheses with our parameters, the curly brackets, and whatever code we want to execute. With anonymous functions, we won't have that name here for the function. We'll just say function and then parameters. Now, we can take that anonymous function and put it into a variable, and then we use it the same way. We call it the same way as we would a named function, but they're still they're different in the way that they're set up by our browser. So this is a named function, and it will get hoisted. This is an anonymous function, and it will not. All right, so here we will get out that yes, please. We write code like this. We have our chocolate that we execute, and then we have the func de definition for the function of chocolate. However, in that second pass, we talked about the first pass of our browsers and our third pass of over JavaScript in our browsers. In that second pass, our browser is looking for named functions. And what it will do with this code is flip it around and add some stuff to it. So we will go from this to this in our browsers. Now, this isn't implementation 
this isn't completely correct in terms of implementation, but it does give you the right idea of the order of what things are happening in our browser with this code. So it will set up a named chocolate uh, in our current scope that we can use in that scope. And then it'll go on and put a function into, set up a function for that name chocolate. Um, it's not actually handled as an anonymous function here. Um, it's slightly different in that for these named functions, our browser won't actually go in and evaluate the code inside of those functions just yet, which means with named functions we can recurse in JavaScript. That's the second big difference with named functions. So we start off by setting up um, our variable for chocolate. We put, choc we put a function into that variable, and then we get to that very first line of code we wrote on the previous slide, and that is where we execute chocolate. So we wrote this, but our browser flipped it around and added some code to the beginning to end up with this before it got to that third pass where it actually executed the code. All right. Arrays and objects. So JavaScript is object-oriented. Everything we deal with in JavaScript is an object. We might have a string with a property of length that tells us how many characters there are in it. And it has methods as well. So we can ask for a substring out of that method to just get some of the characters, but not all. However, when we ask for the type of, say, the string yellow, we'll get string. When we ask for the type of seven, we'll get number. The type of true, we'll see Boolean. And so we call these strings and numbers and Booleans, but they're string objects and number objects and Boolean objects. Here I'm going to ask for the type of an object. So we define objects with curly brackets in JavaScript. And here I'll get object. So this is an object object. Very helpful naming, I, I know. Uh, then I can go on and ask for the type of an array. Uh, and so here I have, I'm defining an empty array with two square brackets. And when I ask for the type of my array, I also get object. So we talk about arrays as arrays or array objects, but in JavaScript they're actually object objects. Now if you have a variable and you want to know whether it's an, ob whether it's an array or an object, you can use um, array.isArray and then pass it in as a parameter. So here I'm passing in an empty array, and when it's an array, I'll get the Boolean true. And when it's not, if it's um, this kind of object, or if it's a string or a number or something else, I'll get false. All right, one more, just for fun. NAN. How many people here have dealt with NAN? <laughs> yes. All right, so you can get NAN back from JavaScript um, if you do some math on two different items just right when some of them aren't numbers. And if we ask for the type of NAN, we'll get number. So not a number is still a number. I throw that in just for fun, because this isn't confusing enough. All right, so let's start using some things with objects. Um, I'm going to set up a var canary, and it's going to be an object. It's got two properties, type and flies. Canaries are birds, so I'm going to make type a bird, and they fly, so true. Then I am going to um, say var bumblebee equals canary. And then bumblebee.type equals insect, because a bumblebee isn't a bird. Then I'm going to take a look at the values I have in canary.type. And here I'll get insect. And this happens because objects, object objects in JavaScript are passed by reference. And so on this first line, when we're setting up this object, this object gets created somewhere, and then we take a reference to it. That reference gets put in canary. When we say bumblebee bumblebee equals canary, what we're doing is we're taking that reference from canary and we're putting it in bumblebee. So we have two separate variables, bumblebee and canary. Two different variables storing the same reference to an object. Bumblebee.type, we'll use that reference and then look up the type and change the type property on, bum on that object. And canary uses the same reference and looks up the type property and we get the value that we put in bumblebee.type because we're manipulating the same object with both variables. And since arrays are also object objects in JavaScript, we end up with the same kind of pattern there. So I'll set up a var daffodil. Um, it's an array with the values 1, 2, 3. Orchid equals daffodil. And then I'll push 4 onto orchid. 
And when I take a look at daffodil, I now have one, two, three, four. So even though we think of them as arrays, we're still treating them as object objects. All right, ES6. So many of the time, most of the time, we can use let as a direct replacement for var. So I can set up um, a variable green, let green equal 21, and then I can change the value of green to 22. However, um, when I ask for window.green, here I'm going to get undefined. So when we use let or const to set up variables, we don't, even if we're working in our global scope, we don't create properties on our Windows object. Here's const. So the idea with const is that it is a constant and not supposed to change. When we have variables that don't change, if we tell our browser that they are constants, our browser will be more be able to work more performantly with that variable. So here I'm going to set up a const sage equal 23. And if I come in and try and change the value of sage to 24, I'll get a JavaScript error because I'm trying to change the value on a constant. Leading practices are to start off your variables as constants and then change them over to let uh, when you know that you need to change them somewhere in your code. Otherwise, you get a performance gain by using const. All right, here's how const behaves with objects. So I'm going to set up um, const lime equals this empty array. And I'm then going to push onto lime the value of 25. I can then take a look at lime, and it's going to be this array with one value in it, 25. Now, if I go on and say, well, now lime should be this array that has the value of 26, that has one value with 26, that's when I'll get a JavaScript error. And that's because we're working by reference here. On this first line, when we set up this empty array, we're setting a, up an array somewhere and then taking that reference and putting it in Lime. We're not allowed to change that reference because it, Lime is a constant. We can go on and use that constant, that, that reference, to add on to that array and look at that array. However, down here, we're creating a whole new array with the value of 26 and then trying to take the reference to that new array and put it in Lime which is a constant. And at that point, we're actually changing the variable lime. And so we have the same pattern happening with um, objects as well. So I can set up a const fern with one property name foo. I can change that name to bar. I can, change, I can add a property number onto it, 27. All of that is OK. When I come down to this bottom line, this is when we get a JavaScript error. I'm setting up a new object. It has the same properties and the same values in them as the previous one, but I'm creating a new object here and trying to put that reference to that new object in Fern, which is set up as a constant, and I'm not allowed to do that. I'm not allowed to change Fern, and I'll get a JavaScript error. All right, code blocks in ES6. So I had an example like this earlier with var and a silly if statement, and here it is with let. So I'm going to set up let olive equal to 28, and then have an if true that I'll always go into. Here I'm going to set up a let olive equal 29, and I can console log out olive here and get 29. If I come down here outside of this if statement and take a look at olive, I'll get the value of 28. So with var, we were scoping to our parent function, or if we're bubbling all the way up, uh, if we're at the very top, our global scope. With let, we scope to our parent code block, which may or may not be our parent function. In this example, our parent code block is this if statement. So I have two different olive variables here. I have one outside the if statement, and I have another inside the if statement. And this one inside the if statement is only available inside here. And when I come out, I get my original one up here. And so you might feel tempted to start using this in your code, silly if trues, um, to isolate some variables you might not use outside of that context. But ES6 gives us a cleaner way to do this with arbitrary code blocks like this. And so this code functions just like the previous slide. Here I'll get a value of 37 for Moss. And when I come outside of that code block, I'll get 36. This becomes especially helpful in loops. And so here it is in a for loop. I'm going to set up my iterator as emerald with let. So let emerald equal 30. And when I go through this for loop, um, the first time I go through, 
I'll console log out 30, then 31, 32, 33, 34. We'll increment emerald again to 35. Now we'll get a false here, because 35 is not smaller than or equal to 34. And we'll come down here. When I try and use emerald here, I get a JavaScript error, because it's not available to me. My emerald va variable was scoped to just inside this for statement. And here this is with var. So we uh, console log out to the same values here, 31, 32, 33, 34. We go from 34 to 35, which breaks us out of our loop. And we find our way down here. Here, if I console log out emerald, I'll see the value of 35. My var emerald here scoped emerald to my parent function, or in this example, because we have no other code and we're not nested inside of anything, in our global scope, our window scope. And so it's still available to me outside of my for loop. All right, so we've gone over scopes in JavaScript and types of functions, both named and um, anonymous. We've gone over hoisting for named functions and variables in JavaScript, the ways in which arrays and objects are extra special, and a little bit of ES6 with let and const. Thank you very much for joining me today. I didn't see any questions on Twitter, but some, anyone in the room? Questions? Come on, no questions. 25 minutes of presentation and code and zero questions. I think we've got one over there. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I guess that was a variable shadowing, right? There were the different scopes of lights, right? Sorry, what was that? I mean, this variable shadowing when you have these. Anyways, uh, isn't this an anti pattern like using them like? those in the, these scopes making developers all confused yes so so reusing the same variables in different scopes can get very confusing uh, my examples were trying to illustrate what happens when you have the same variables uh, same variable names you generally want to an avoid that however we do end up with lots of variables named name or description or other common words where this starts to um, show up more often, uh, especially when we're working on very large JavaScript projects. Not every single one of our variables is going to have a unique name unless we're going to get very, very long or arbitrary with our variable names. But yes, the, these examples were fairly contrived. <laughs> yeah, so a question for me. Uh, more or less all of these examples are extremely confusing. What would be your recommendations to avoid them r when writing production code? So how do you uh, limit the ways of you can make a mistake because of such of these things? Well, I think number one is being mindful about what scope you're putting things in um, and, and having a view of um, where that's going to be used so that you aren't accidentally using someone else's variable that has the same name as yours. Um, while we can't completely avoid, uh, practically we can't avoid having completely unique variable names everywhere throughout our pro bigger projects, um, that is something that we do strive to do, or at least I strive to do, to have more descriptive names for those variables. And so th doing that will help reduce issues with code like this. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was very insightful. And my question is uh, var versus let performance-wise. Uh, what is better? And that is a great question. I don't know. But I can try and get back to you on that. Uh, leading practices are that if you're going to use const or let, you only use const and let, and you don't mix in var. But I'm not sure what the performance implications of that are. Uh, OK, I have a question. Uh, you talked about uh, three phases in uh, JavaScript. And uh, if, we, like, if we write var variables at the top of the function, then JavaScript skips the second part because we already did it, right? And if you use it, can you make uh, functions perform faster, like for performance opinion? So um, if we go to the top of our functions and we just say var foo, and then go to our next one and do var bar, and so on, um, then we will be writing code more like what our browser would interpret it as. Um, however, if you do code where you say var foo equals, um, 
and, and you put a value into that variable right away, that code is going to get changed by your browser to split that out um, regardless because you're going to have probably other variables set up in that same, like on the next line. It might help if I bring up some code. So if we have var foo equals one and var bar equals two, um, this is still going to get, even if it's at the top of our function, it's going to get changed by our browser to something like this. with this, this line moved down. Um, so our browser will end up parsing out something like this. Um, I'm not sure about the performance implications of doing this ahead of time or not. In terms of writing more readable code where you understand what's going on in your browser, this is a good thing to do um, because then you, you know what, where your variable is um, getting shown up and when the value is actually in it. Um, but performance wise, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, the last question comes from Twitter. Does let get hoisted to lazy to Google? Yes, let does get hoisted, but it gets hoisted to its parent code block and not its parent function. Though the, the uh, parent code block could be the parent function. Um, so um, I don't have any examples of that, but yes. Awesome, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.